so this week we're going to talk a little bit about the history of whole shapes and what they do. Now this is a subject that basically has one of two settings, either mind-numbingly complex or relatively basic introduction and primer. Since we're not going to be publishing a, you know, something like a 84 hour length runtime pocket degree course on merchant and warship hull design. Shockingly enough, we're going to go more with the history and primer approach. So let's get into that. What we're going to do is first examine the four primary issues that you have to take into account when you're trying to decide what kind of hull form you're going to use for your ship. And then once we've established the baseline parameters for that and how they might vary, we're then going to look at a number of individual elements that perhaps might affect your whole choice throughout history and some others that might affect your whole choice at specific points through history and how people have historically worked out how these ba things should be balanced against each other. So the four basic things that are almost universal considerations are speed, stability, volume and draft. Speed obviously in warships is generally quite important but in certain circumstances might not be so important. And of course there may be many factors influencing how you're attaining whatever speed you've decided you want to go for. It could be oars, it could be sails, it could be propellers, it could be paddle wheels, it could be any number of things. But generally speaking, when it comes to speed and hull form selection generally, a longer, thinner hull is better for speed compared to a shorter and fatter hull. This is because for a ship, you have to proceed through water, and water is a fluid. Except that unlike air, for most marine engineering purposes, water is a fluid that can be treated as pretty much incompressible. Air on the other hand can be compressed, and that means that you have to get the water out of your way in order to proceed, pretty much immediately. If you then consider a ship from a bow on perspective, you'll notice that the overall cross-sectional area of the ship appears to be somewhat smaller than it is if you look on the ship from a side-on view. And therefore, because you're having to exert the force from your propulsion over a smaller surface area, there is less resistance from the water, not in terms of less resistance per square meter or per square foot, but simply there are fewer square meters or square feet of water that you're having to push through. If, on the other hand, your ship is very wide, then obviously you're pushing through or pushing past considerably more water, and therefore there will be a lot more resistance to your progress. Now, of course, it does have to be mentioned that because you're operating in a 3D environment underwater, this also includes draft, which is one of the other big four major concerns. But specifically with regard to speed, there's usually relatively little point in coming up with a very, very narrow hull if that means that your draft is going to get much, much deeper because that means overall you're probably still going to have a fairly large surface area facing in the direction of your motion. When it comes to speed, the shape of your bow and to a certain extent the shape of your stern are also important factors, but we'll come to talk about the specifics of some of that a little bit later on. For the minute, though, it should be fairly obvious that a fairly bluff bow, in most cases, i.e. a blunt, probably somewhat rounded one, is less conducive to high-speed operations than the relatively sharp profiled bows that are more typical of ships of the 20th and 21st century, and indeed many ships of the 19th. One of the other major factors when it comes to hull design and speed is that it takes a fair bit of power to move a ship through water. Water is a fairly dense substance, and the faster you go, the more power you need, and it's not a linear relationship. Indeed, the amount of power you need to move a ship only a few knots faster than the speed that the rest of your ships can make can be considerably greater, and this only increases the faster you go. So, for example, if you have a ship that's capable of 14 knots, and you want a ship that's capable of 16 or 18 knots, you can do that with a reasonable increase on power, assuming that you've got a ship of roughly the same displacement. Conversely, if you have a ship that's capable of 28 knots, and you want it to move just north of 30 knots, well, you're going considerably faster to start with, but the comparative increase in power is significantly greater. 
Now, there's all sorts of reasons of hydrodynamics that govern that, but this is a discussion about hole design, which does affect or is affected by hydrodynamics, but is not specifically about hydrodynamics. So suffice to say, that is the case. But one of the other advantages of a long, thin hole form is that when you're going for speed and you need all that power, the long part allows you plenty of space within the vessel to put lots of machinery to give you that power. Or in the case of a sail vessel, to install lots of masts. Or in the case of an oared vessel, to put lots of oars in. There are, however, a number of compromises when it comes to hull form and speed, if you desire high speed. One of them is that the finer your bow is, and therefore the more you can, if you like, cut through the water, the less buoyant your bow is, and that can have effects on sea keeping, which is something else we'll discuss later. You also don't want your bow to flare out too quickly, which means that a considerable portion of your hull is going to be relatively narrow, which is going to limit what you can do with it. In 20th century examples, you might look at something like the Pensacola class. Being cruisers, they needed to be moving at a high speed, but the bow was fine enough, and that fineness carried far enough back, that when it came to the first gun turret position, the hull was not physically wide enough for them to fit a triple turret and barbette, without some fairly major design compromises, and so you ended up with twins with triple super firing aft when there was more hull volume to insert the triple turret and its accompanying wider barbette. Speed in a hull form also requires a much more finely balanced and tuned hull form, whilst something like a slightly misplaced section of ballast or some cargo placed in an inopportune section of the ship might compromise the hydrodynamics of a hull in any ship to a point that it affects the ship's overall top speed. If you're in a freighter and you're only expecting to, say, be steaming along in 1916 at 8 to 10 knots, well, if you have compromised your weighting to a point that you're losing 10% of your speed, so you're travelling at, let's say, 9 knots instead of 10 knots, it's not exactly the end of the world. Whereas if you are motoring along at 30 knots and your distributed cargo and ballast has compromised your speed, well, the chances are the effect on your speed is actually going to be considerably greater than the same kind of effect on a freighter because of the aforementioned need for considerably more power and the fact you will have increased the resistance through the water and all sorts of other wonderful factors. But even if it's just the same proportion, which would be incredibly generous and lucky for you. A 10% loss of speed at 30 knots is a 3 knot loss of speed, which now means you're down to 27 knots, which means that if, for example, you're looking at a treaty battleship versus your not really quite treaty compliant battleship, but you misload it, you've now spent all of that extra weight and all of that extra power for nothing because the treaty battleship, as long as it's still in good trim, is now a knot faster than you. One of the other compromises you make with a hull that's designed for speed is that because you tend to be very long but relatively narrow, it can have some rather negative effects on one of the other three remaining major factors, stability. Now, stability might seem to be a relatively obvious thing. Uh, a stable ship stays upright, and generally most people on ships like staying upright because if you don't, the alternative is capsizing, which tends to be usually quite fatal. But there are a few factors which might influence exactly how stable you want your ship to be. For one thing, if you want to have any kind of platform that is much above the level of the water, you are going to be compromising on stability. But very, very few navies ever go out with effectively a heavily armed raft. Even the US monitors of the American Civil War, which to be fair probably are the ones that come the closest to being described as heavily armed rafts, still had gun houses or gun turrets that projected considerably far above the water. Now raising a ship's hull considerably above the water does also help with things like sea keeping, which again we will discuss later, but for stability purposes you have to accept that your ship is going to have a degree of instability. The question is simply, how much of a degree are you going to accept? Any and all ships ever built 
have a point of no return. And this is effectively, if you tilt the ship to a certain angle, at some point you'll reach a given angle, whereupon the ship will tend to continue to roll over onto its side, as opposed to spring back to being upright. And once it's past that point, in almost any case, you are going down. Now, this involves three fairly key concepts, and they can sometimes appear to be slightly counterintuitive, but hopefully I will try and explain them in a way that everybody understands. These three concepts are the center of gravity, the center of buoyancy, and the metacentric height. The center of gravity is the point within the ship, hopefully, about which the ship will rotate when forces are exerted on it that make that happen, such as wind or waves. Whilst the center of gravity represents the central point around which all of the ship's mass is based, the center of buoyancy is the center of mass for the volume of water displaced by the ship. And so, therefore, in a normal condition, the center of buoyancy will be below the center of gravity. Now, this is important because the two being independent of each other means that if a ship rolls, you can see the center of buoyancy moves out of alignment with the center of gravity. And if it moves too far out of alignment, you can end up with a case where the ship's mass is pulling the vessel down but through, via the center of gravity, the ship's buoyancy is pushing up through the center of buoyancy, and if they're far enough apart laterally, the ship will continue to capsize, and then you end up with a ship upside down. This is, of course, disregarding everything else that would happen during a capsize with things like water potentially flooding through holes caused by damage, portholes, deck hatches and the like. We're just assuming that the ship itself is, relatively speaking, self-contained and sealed. Now, if you draw a vertical line from where the center of buoyancy is straight up, and you draw a line that is vertical through the ship, through the center of gravity, if the ship is completely stable and on an even keel, these lines should overlap. However, as the ship rolls, the line that's drawn through the center of gravity will obviously now incline because the entire ship is inclining, whereas the center of buoyancy's line stays vertical. Where these two lines intersect is known as the metacentric height. These two lines form two sides of a right angle triangle, and if you go back to the center of gravity and you draw a horizontal line until it intersects that line from the center of buoyancy, you form a right angle triangle, and that last distance that you've drawn is known as the writing arm. And that's not writing as in writing down things on paper, that's writing as in getting the vessel back upright. So you now have whatever force is being exerted on the ship's mass that is causing it to heal, pressing down, and you have the force of the ship's buoyancy pressing up through this same distance. So this is acting as a lever. The question then becomes, at what point does any remaining ship's buoyancy that's pressing up become equal to the amount of force that's pressing down through the ship's mass. Once that is equal, you've reached your point of stability. Once the amount of mass pressing down through that lever is greater than the amount of buoyancy pressing up through that lever, you now will continue to capsize. And obviously that can be changed by a number of things. Say if you're battle damaged, if you've got water now in the ship, that's mass that's contributing to pulling your ship down and your buoyancy is less, which is doubly bad for you. But also, as that lever increases and as the ship continues to roll over, high mounted things that are very heavy, like say gun turrets, will exert a proportionally greater effect on your ship's stability the further over it heals as compared to when the ship is perfectly stable. So this is why a relatively thin hull can be quite bad, because a thin hull can be quite usually tall and thin, and therefore there's already a fair bit of mass fairly high in the ship, so when the ship heals over, it's much easier to reach this point of no return. Conversely, a relatively wide hull has a lot of stability because it's going to take an awful lot of angle of heel, which is going to require an awful lot of force, 
before the majority of the ship's mass is past that center of gravity point at a point where it can overcome the ship's buoyancy. This is, for example, one of the reasons why a tumble home hull, as seen in French pre-dreadnoughts and more recently on some new classes of vessel, can be exceptionally good for stability, but is also absolutely terrible when it comes to a ship that has been battle damaged. The reason for this is that because on a tumble home design the vast majority of a ship's hull volume is below the waterline, its centre of gravity is quite low. Proportionally speaking, relatively little of the ship's mass is up high above the waterline, so as the ship heals there's not a tremendous amount of mass that's pulling down on that writing arm, whilst conversely there is a lot of buoyancy pushing back up because of the wide underwater part of the hull. This all in turn also means that the ship's not going to roll that far either, because any small force that's exerted pushing the ship over is going to be met by a considerably larger force pushing back. The problem is that if you take battle damage and water is now coming into the ship because the hull again is fairly wide underwater, that water that's now occupying space and contributing to the mass of the vessel is quite far out from the centre of gravity and therefore has a, relatively speaking, considerably greater effect. This also moves the ship's centre of buoyancy. And you can quickly end up in a situation where as the ship lists you've got the mass of the upper part of the ship which is now pulling down on that writing arm to one side of the centre of gravity plus the mass of the water that's come in which is also now pulling down over quite a considerable arm is pulling with a considerable amount of force but the centre of buoyancy might actually well have shifted to the other side of the ship's centre of gravity. And now you've got the rolling force, the waves or whatever, and the mass of the water that's come in, etc., and gravity pulling the ship down one way, and you have the force of the ship's buoyancy pushing up the other way, you now have created complete rotational motion and the ship goes over very quickly and easily. And you're in a bit of a catch-22 because theoretically one of the ways to avoid the worst effect of the water intruding is to not have so many bulkheads that are keeping the water over there and just let the water flow through in which case the ship will just gradually settle but of course because so much of the volume of your vessel is underwater that's going to have a disproportionate effect on your overall buoyancy anyway plus of course you know you now have water running all the way crossways through your ship. But as long as you can keep your ship clear and free of any major hull breaches it does offer a huge amount of stability, which is one of the reasons why many Age of Sail ships of the line and such like also exhibit a tumble home structure, because they have some fairly large levers, known as masts, pulling down on the ship every time the ship rolls any considerable amount. When it comes to stability and warships in particular though, although this does have something of an effect on the habitability of the ship as well in general cases, you have to also consider the rolling period, because this can make the difference between a ship that is stable, incredibly stable, but completely useless as a gun platform, or a ship that's perhaps slightly less stable but better as a gun platform. Now obviously ideally you want a ship as a gun platform that's going to stay as nice and level as possible in the most sea states possible. But this represents something of a catch-22, because the sea state inevitably is going to end up tipping your ship up in some way, shape or form. Your initial resistance to rolling regardless of. Now, when that happens, a ship that is massively stable, so perhaps a very wide ship that's relatively low for its height, that's going to have such a tremendous writing movement it's going to snap back to level pretty much the instant that the massive wave or swell or whatever that's tipped you over goes away. This is actually very bad for gunnery because it means that in those kinds of sea states your ship is going to be moving through its rolling motion very quickly and that is going to be perhaps in early states beyond the ability of your gun's compensation devices to control for. 
in states before gun stabilization was even a thing. It means your crew are going to have to deal with the fact their ship is basically going on a minor side to side roller coaster, which, you know, considering that you're working usually with slow matches, maybe with flint locks and with aiming via the human eye, etc., is going to reduce your accuracy down to hopelessly terrible. It's also going to slam your ship around a fair bit, which doesn't do a lot for your long term durability. And even on perhaps more advanced vessels, such as the types you might see in World War II, it's going to tax both the gun's stabilization systems and your rangefinders and their operators a lot. It also means your fire control systems, which are having to make all the adjustments for this, are going to have to be working overtime because things are suddenly going to be changing direction left, right and centre. And all of this is going to affect your, the stability and accuracy of your guns. Now, obviously, if your ship will roll on wet grass or something equally silly, then you have the opposite problem. If your ship's going constantly all over the place, then you're never going to have a moment of stability, no matter how calm the sea is. So when it comes to choosing a stable hull form for a warship, you tend to want a hull form that's something of a balance between the two. It will resist rolling in the calmer sea state, but when it does start to roll, you want generally a hull form that will roll somewhat slowly, somewhat gently, even if it rolls slightly further and slightly more often than a super stable hull, that will mean the actual rate of change in your angle is considerably slower, and that's much, much easier to compensate for when it comes to firing weaponry. And a final note on stability is that for a warship, the hull form that offers this perfect, hopefully, balance of stability is going to be very different from the hull form that offers a similar balance of stability for a merchant vessel, because merchant vessels tend to carry a lot of cargo, usually quite heavy cargo, which tends to occupy the lowest parts of the ship's hold first, and therefore a cargo vessel, a merchant ship, is normally relatively heavy, relatively low down. These days that can change, but in the time period we're talking about, that's generally where all your cargo was stored. Whereas for a warship, when you've got heavy gun turrets, deck armour, and even in some cases belt armour that might be mounted relatively high in the ship, both in absolute terms and also in terms of relative to the centre of gravity, that's going to demand a rather different hull form because that is now needs to be supported by the overall buoyancy and stability of the ship. This is one of the reasons why French pre-dreadnoughts, for example, had tumble home hulls, because they had to support all of this mass relatively high up in the ship, whereas you don't tend to see that many tumble home hulled merchant vessels. Related to all of this, of course, is the third factor, the volume of the ship. Hull volume is incredibly important, because hull volume dictates how much fuel you can store if you are a steam-powered vessel, how much supplies you can take aboard, how much ammunition you can carry, how many crew you can carry, how many guns you can get on the ship, and so on and so forth. So the greater the volume of the vessel, the more you can get aboard, the further you can go, the more you can do. However, obviously, more volume means greater size, which means greater expense. And it's not just your sort of static supplies and stores that you need to worry about. You've also got to think about machinery. If you're going with a long, thin hull for speed, you need a lot of volume to pack in the machinery because you need a lot of machinery to attain the necessary amount of power. Now, you may be willing to compromise on certain things like crew accommodation or a certain amount of fuel, so you might have a ship that's relatively short range, in order to keep the overall hull volume down. And obviously everything you add in adds mass. So you can end up with something of a tail chasing effect where if you want to go at a certain speed, you need a certain amount of machinery, therefore you need a certain hull volume. But if you also want to couple that speed with range, you need more fuel tanks and more food supplies. That's going to mean an even greater hull volume, except now that because you've increased your hull volume, you now need more machinery because it now displaces more. And therefore, as the amount of machinery goes up, you now need more fuel to power that machinery, which means your fuel tanks increase in size. And now all of a sudden you have a bigger ship and now because of its 
got more mass, you now need to increase your machinery again, and so on and so forth. So this is why there are certain practical upper limits as to how fast you can practically make a large warship go, if it's going to go any considerable distance, at various stages, at least during the steam-powered era. And with sail vessels as well, apart from the wind obviously being something of a limiting factor, there is hull volume versus the number of masts you can fit, and so on and so forth. Now, if you are prepared to sacrifice some things, say, size of the guns and overall range, then you can cut down on those quite considerably, and you can reduce the hull volume, and suddenly you can go perhaps a lot faster, which is how you end up with something like a destroyer or a small, fast cruiser. But there are some things you can't cut down on. For example, supplies. If you're in the age of sail, your ship might be assigned to a mission that could take it months if not years. Now, granted, you might try and resupply at various points, but the points between resupply, especially with the unpredictability of the wind and where you might end up, mean that you have to build in an awful lot of redundancy into the amount of supplies you take aboard. Whereas for a steam-powered vessel, you pretty much know how long you're going to be out there for, in part because you only have a certain amount of fuel, and in part because with steam power you can largely dictate when and where you go. So you can afford to have a slightly narrower margin on your supplies in a steam powered vessel than you can with an age of sail vessel. Of course, because of the square cube law, a larger vessel is more efficient when it comes to volume, but is also more expensive. So you have the eternal battle between shipbuilders who are trying to push the limits of how big you can actually build a ship in order to get the most efficient solution, and the treasury that has to pay for it, who are rather less keen on spending fantastic amounts of money on a single vessel. So to give a quick illustration of what I mean by the square cube law, let's imagine you have a square block, one by one by one. And it doesn't matter whether that's an inch, a foot, a meter, a centimeter, whatever. It is one arbitrary unit of dimension in all dimensions. Now, obviously, it has a linear length in any given dimension of one, it has a volume of one cubic unit of measurement, and it has a surface area of six, because it has six faces, because it's a cube. Now, if you increase that linear dimension by one in all aspects, so instead of one by one by one, it's now two by two by two, now things get interesting. So because linearly, you've doubled the dimension but in terms of surface area, you now have six two by two faces, and those two by two faces are of course each four, so you have six times four, you now have 24. So compared to the six that you had before, you have increased the overall surface area by a factor of four. But in terms of volume, you now have eight, because you have two along each edge, so 2 multiplied by 2 multiplied by 2 again gives you 8. So your volume has gone up from 1 to 8. So your volume has gone up by a factor of 8. A good way of illustrating this would be to look at, say, most large destroyers of the Second World War, Fletcher class, Tribal class, something of that size. Now look at the battleships of the 1930s and 1940s, perhaps the exception of the Yamato, you will tend to find that most of the battleships are two and a half to three times the size of the destroyers, depending on which dimension you're looking at. It can be down to anything around about twice the length, but usually two and a half to three times the beam, and draft and height above the waterline is also usually two and a half to three times. So you can average it out to around two and a half, just over two and a half times the size linearly. But of course, most destroyers of that kind of displacement we just quoted are around 2,000 tonnes or just over. And bearing in mind, displacement is a measure of the amount of volume of water that the ship has to displace in order to float. Whilst most of the battleships are 35,000 tonnes plus, so well over a factor of 10, which you know, lines up with two and a half to three times versus twice being eight times. So, once you've decided on your hull form as far as speed, stability, and the volume you're going to have internally and is all concerned, you also have to worry with what your draft is going to be. Now, a draft can have lots of different implications depending on 
thereabouts you are, both in time and geography. For example, in the Age of Sail, having a relatively deep draft vessel for the size of vessels that was being built wasn't really a concern for the vast majority of nations, but it was quite a problem for the Dutch, and to a lesser extent the Swedes and the Russians and the Baltic. Because in those areas you had very, very shallow seas, and if you had a ship that had too much draft, you couldn't really safely operate in and around your home territory because you'd end up grounding somewhere. Whereas if you're in most English, Scottish, French, Spanish ports, etc. During that period, you could be about as deep draft as you can make a wooden ship, and it's probably not going to matter in most cases, unless you try sailing up a river, that's what dredgers are for. But as time goes on, you get a kind of a weird inversion, because as steam power becomes a thing, you can more reliably dredge channels, so people like the Dutch Navy can actually afford considerably deeper draft vessels because they can keep certain channels to and from their deep water ports open. Whereas uh, when iron and then steel ships get bigger and therefore their draft gets deeper, those other nations who previously had not a concern in the world for the most part when it came to their naval vessels and draft suddenly found that this was quite a considerable problem to the extent that some navies had to make specific design decisions where they were accepting hull forms that were not necessarily the ideal for their overall stated objectives simply because the ships would not otherwise fit in certain ports. And of course you have other issues such as do the linear dimensions of your ship allow you to fit into certain dry docks but that's more of an infrastructure limitation than it is a consideration when it comes to the hull itself. And draft, as we've alluded to earlier, can have effects on all the other major factors. A very deep draft hull, for example, will slow you down. A shallow draft hull, less so, at least in most circumstances. A deeper draft hull tends to lend you a bit more stability. A shallower draft hull can lend you less stability, unless, of course, you have a very wide ship, in which case that might be, be not be the case. For example, a monitor, in the sense of the World War I and World War II era monitors, could be a very wide ship, would be necessarily slow, had a good mouth hull volume to support very heavy guns, but its draft, because it had to operate off coastal waters, would be very shallow. And so when you take all these factors into account, you begin to understand a little bit of why various ship types seem to follow certain design trends. Destroyers and most cruisers are aiming for very high speed so they tend to have longer, thinner hulls than battleships that perhaps are more concerned with overall stability because of very heavy guns atop them, and you know they need a lot of volume to store all their supplies. Battle cruisers have even greater amounts of volume because they need the speed, they need the stability, but they need massive amounts of volume for their machinery. They also tend to be slightly shallower draft because, again, that helps with the speed element, and they'll tend to accept perhaps a slight reduction in stability, again in aid of the speed element. So you've roughed out the basic dimensions and proportions of your hull. Now all the fine detail begins, and the fine detail can vary depending on what kind of ship you're building and what time period you're in. So let's go over some of those other smaller details relatively briefly. Durability is an issue you have to think about. How durable you want your warship hull might seem to be an obvious question, but it is actually, again, somewhat more complex. For example, if you're building a trireme for the Greek navy of ancient times, you're not particularly concerned with the durability of the vessel from a perpendicular direction. Yes, you're probably going to get rammed from that direction, but to be perfectly honest, that's going to do a lot of damage anyway. Where the main shock of hopefully you ramming the enemy is going to come from is from the front. So you want your trireme to be very resistant to impact from the front. Uh, you don't want it to just shiver apart as soon as, it, as soon as it hits anything. And this will go on to dominate the design of galleys and other such vessels in the Mediterranean for a considerable portion of time all the way through into the Middle Ages. Now, ideally, yeah, you'd like to have a ship that could stand up to ramming to a certain degree from the side, and some larger vessels that were built at the time were. But, looking back at those other considerations, the four main ones, you want to be fairly quick 
So if you're going to build a ship that's very long linearly and and very strong linearly, then if you want it to be fast, given that most of your power in battle is going to be coming from oars and perhaps one sail, then you can't afford necessarily the extra weight that's going to would need to go into the sides to make it particularly durable. Stability, well, you know, triremes they sail mostly in the Mediterranean. They're not particularly known in that area for surviving storms very much, but that's because the Mediterranean tends to have two settings flat calm or why are you even outside of your own port you stupid moron hull volume on a trireme can be pretty low i mean you've got a lot of rowers aboard true you have some marines aboard as well but you don't need a tremendous amount of supplies because you're not going particularly far or particularly for any considerable amount of time you might even be stopping off overnight and your ships are going to spend a lot of their time stored on land so you don't need long distance supplies and such like and again you want to keep the volume as low as possible because the lowest possible volume means the minimum amount of hull which means the highest possible speed which again comes into the fact that your main speed and maneuvering capability in battle is going to be provided by your oarsmen who have finite amounts of energy and for similar reasons you want them to be fairly shallow draft but if you go to another type of warship the classic wooden warship of the Age of Sail, everything almost flips on its head. Yes, you'd like to have speed, but you really, really need your stability. You really need the ship to be durable. Durable means it's going to be built very heavily, and that means even more stability, because a very heavy ship needs to be very stable. Your hull volume needs to be quite large, because as we mentioned earlier, you might be going on missions that last months or years. And your draft is going to be fairly deep as well, because by the time you reach the Age of Sail, you have a lot of heavy ironwork higher up, supporting your guns, and, you know, being your guns as well, as well as the shot that's being fired from said guns, and therefore you need quite a bit of displacement relative to something like a trireme in order to keep everything afloat. To give a more modern example, destroyers in World War One, World War II periods, they were not particularly known for their durability under gunfire, battleships on the other hand were supposed to be very durable under gunfire and this in part taking into account those other four major factors does influence their hull shape as well the material you have available will also inf influence your hull shape wood is the building material of choice for the vast majority of time that warships are around wood has certain limitations you can build a very finely pointed bow out of wood. The clipper ships are a good example of that. But a clipper bowed vessel is, relatively speaking, quite fragile when it comes to something like combat. Guns can quite easily shoot through it. There's not an awful lot of structure there because, you know, it's quite thin. So if they do hit something, they could break something rather important for keeping your bow attached. If you do end up hitting something, then, well, that's going to crumple in like a cheap cardboard. And, of course, a clipper bow means it's very difficult to put bow chasers in place, amongst various other things. You also have to consider the method of building as well. But, generally speaking, a clipper bow is not the best form for a durable warship made of wood. Whereas by the time you get to ships made of iron, ships made of steel, you can make a very fine, very pointed bow to emphasise your ability for sea keeping and speed over that of most wooden ships, because the durability of iron and steel is considerably greater for most combat related cases, and therefore the material has quite a significant effect on your overall choice of hull form. Your armament can make quite a significant effect on your choice of hull form as well. For example, again looking at the Age of Sail, your armament is primarily concentrated on your broadsides, but your armament also runs near enough, not quite, but almost completely fore to aft, which means that your ship has to be able to support the weight of at least one, possibly more gun decks, all the way along. And thus, there's another reason to not have a very fine clipper bow because you need the buoyancy all along the ship to support this armament. Whereas once you get into the age of turreted guns, World War I, World War II, even the uh, latter part of the 19th century, 
now you have a choice of concentrating your armament amidships. Except that most of that armament, not necessarily all of it, because casement guns are still a thing, but most of it, and especially the heaviest stuff, is usually in turrets, and they're usually mounted, proportional to the vessel, considerably higher than the guns that are normally found on an Age of Sail ship of the line, or frigate. Now, because all this heavy weight is concentrated closer amidships, it does mean that you can afford to play around with the bow and the stern shape in order to attain better speed or agility or efficiency or whatever you like, but it also means you have to have a lot of buoyancy amidships to support all of this, and it also means you need considerably greater stability when you're considering the effect of the armament on the ship. Now, I specifically mentioned armament on the ship because you also have to consider your power plant. In a ship of the line, for example, your underwater hull form, your underwater hull volume is mostly dictated by concerns of stability and the fact that you have you know, big sails. They form a very big lever, so you want absolute maximum possible center of gravity shifted as low as possible, hence the tumble home hull. Whereas once you go into iron and steel ships, you have very heavy engines low down in the ship. That helps keep the center of gravity low. But over time, iron ships and then steel ships start to lose their masts. So the big, long levers acting on the ship have gone. Conversely, as we mentioned, the armament is somewhat higher, so that makes up for it slightly. But you also have to consider with your hull form where the force of propulsion is acting. Because if you look at your center of gravity from a side-on perspective, if your sails, your masts, are propelling you forwards, well, on an age of sail vessel, all that propulsive force is coming well above the center of gravity. Now, granted, that's obviously the sails are pulling on the mast, the masts are pushing on the hull, the hull is moving forward. But generally, compared to the center of gravity, there is a little bit of a lever motion trying to push your ship's bow down and into the water. Now, if you have a relatively bluff bow, it's relatively easy to resist that, and of course you can ballast the ship against that as well. But that will affect how you design your hull. Whereas, if you have a steam vessel and your propulsion is coming from screw propellers mounted aft in the ship and low down below the centre of gravity, there is a very slight lever action pushing the ship up. And that is going to change how your hull is shaped, because now your bow, if your bow is perhaps a little bit too thin, perhaps has its own sectional negative buoyancy, your bow might be tempted to dip down into the water, and changes the overall surface area of hull in the water, and imposes strain on the ship, especially because most steam-powered vessels, by the time we're talking about the late 19th century and the early 20th century, have some very heavy concentrations of weight amidships in the form of machinery and weaponry. So if your bow is coming down, then you have a point of stress on the ship's hull, which is not good. Conversely, the bow being lifted up whilst the stern is being pulled down, that's going to pose some other issues because obviously you don't want your bow to lift too far out of the water. Pretty much the same reason you don't want your stern to drop too far down into the water. So you don't want your bow to be too buoyant, but at the same time you don't want it to be too negatively buoyant because otherwise you end up with sea spray coming up and you know the entire sea coming over your bow and that's not a good thing either so the method of propulsion is quite the deciding factor when it comes to hull forms you also have freeboard and sea keeping as we mentioned if you have a hull that's relatively low down it will be very stable but in big waves or pretty much anything above a flat calm where you proceed very slowly you're going to end up with water coming over your ship. That can induce something very negative, even assuming the water doesn't get into your ship, called the free surface effect. And that can affect your overall stability, it can affect your overall ship's propulsion efficiency, and in the worst cases, that free surface effect can cause you to capsize. The free surface effect is basically when you have an element of mobile mass, usually in this case, obviously water, which is acting independently of the main mass of water, i.e. the sea. So if you have a large amount of water on your deck, or were still inside your ship, still above a certain deck, well, if your ship 
is completely level, the water should, in theory, be distributed completely levelly as well, although it is going to change the overall centre of gravity because it's now part of the mass of the ship rather than the mass of the sea. If, however, then your ship rolls, then that water, being liquid, will, unless it's got some kind of major impediment to it, such as bulkheads, all flow down towards the side of the ship that has rolled down. This makes your roll, or if your pitch, if the water's flowing backwards and forwards, considerably worse, because you now not only have all this additional weight, which is now lopsided on one side or one end of your vessel, but it's also got its own inertia coming that way, which is going to exert even more force, which is going to pull you over one way or the other. In a best case scenario, that might make you just roll a little bit more, maybe pitch a little bit more. In a real best case scenario, it might actually dampen the effect of the sea on you, because if the free surface effect, let's say, is pushing your bow down, at the same time as a wave from the sea is pushing your bow up, as long as your bow can take the stress of the two forces acting in opposite directions, your actual pitch level might decrease. But in a ship with battle damage, then that free surface effect might make things even worse, might force the ship to list even further to one side or the other. It might force the ships to pitch or roll further than it otherwise would, and that might expose openings in the ship, whether built in or created recently by explosive shells, and that might let in more water, or the ship might just go over anyway. So overall, it's generally something to avoid. But of course, if you build the ship up above the water, you have more freeboard, you have better sea keeping, that goes back to affecting your stability. So again, a major consideration with hull design. One attempt to compromise on this kind of thing can be seen in the design of a lot of early 20th century warships, where you will have a relatively high bow, because that gives you good sea keeping, good freeboard, but further aft, where perhaps the sea keeping of ploughing through the waves is not so necessary, but you want to save on displacement, you want to increase the stability by dropping the hull down somewhat, you'll see a step down in that hull. Now on some destroyers, you might just have the raised forecastle alone, whereas on battleships, battle cruisers, you might have the raised forecastle that might continue along the superstructure, usually where the casemate battery is, and then there'll be a step down aft at the quarterdeck level. Although by having this change point in your ship structure, you are presenting a potential area of stress because one part of your ship now has completely different material and structural properties to another part of the ship because it's more of a box girder, the other's more of a rectangular girder. And so they're going to respond slightly differently to the same input, such as say wave action, which if you get too much stress concentrated in that area, either because the two parts of the ship are acting too differently, or there's too much force, or the ship's structure isn't strong enough, might end up with some hull fracturing, which is usually not a good thing. Two final factors we're going to consider in this video, because as I said, this is hull design, this is something upon which massive numbers of books have been published, and you could go on forever and a day on, but we're going to look at turning, and we're going to look at vortexes, friction and resistance. Now, why might turning affect your hull design? Well, simply put, the longer a hull is, proportional to its width and its draft, the harder it is to turn. And the shorter it is, the easier it is to turn, and therefore the more manoeuvrable a ship will be. You can try to change this to a certain degree with having bigger rudders, and ultimately, obviously, there is a centre point of rotation, and a rudder that's acting at the end of a much longer vessel will exert more force proportionally on the ship than a, sm a smaller rudder will. So increasing rudder size or increasing number of rudders is a way to make a long, thin ship turn somewhat better. But no matter how big, realistically, you can make the rudder, you have to also take into account that if you're providing a force going one way on a ship that's trying to turn, then everything at, on the other side of the center of rotation is pushing into the water. And this comes back all the way to what we mentioned right at the beginning about, you know, the total surface area facing the direction of travel, because now your direction of travel is port or starboard, at least for this particular aspect of your velocity. 
and all of that water is now resisting you. And yes, you might have a rudder at the end of a very long lever at the stern of your ship, but all that water that's now resisting your bow coming around is also at the end of a very long lever at the other end of your ship. And the total surface area of, let's say, your entire bow is considerably greater than the total surface area of your rudder. So resistance is going to be quite high and any kind of realistic level of force you can exert is going to result in a ship only gradually turning its way through the water. Whereas on a shorter vessel, which simply has to displace far less water to turn relative to its overall displacement, it will be able to turn faster. Now, that's just a general rule of thumb, assuming roughly similar hull forms, roughly similar rudder sizes or numbers, etc., etc. But it does broadly hold true, because outside of a very, very few fancy tricks, it's almost impossible to fully overcome that disadvantage. And so you end up having to strike some kind of balance. If you really want speed, you're going to have to accept the ship's probably not going to be that agile. However, if you really want agility, you are equally going to have to accept that that ship is probably not going to be as fast as similar sized competitors that are going more for the speed. And generally, people will try and strike a bargain somewhere between the two with their hull forms that best serves their purposes. One example that has been mentioned before on the channel is looking at third-rate ships of the line in the Napoleonic period. The French, for example, would tend to build an 80-gun ship of the line for a third rate. It was quite quick because it was somewhat longer compared to its beam than a British 74-gun ship of the line was. Incidentally, the British kind of adopt the 74-gun off of a previous generation of French third rates, but that's another story. But anyway, the French ship would therefore tend to be somewhat faster, but it would be less agile. The British vessel, unless other aspects such as its underwater hull shape were particularly good, would tend to be slower than the French vessel, but it would be considerably more agile. So if you were in a chase, the French ship would usually win the chase, whether it was running away or whether it was chasing, assuming all other things were equal which obviously in most cases there weren't, there were a lot of variables, but it did give the friendship an inherent advantage, uh, apart from other factors, in a straight line chase. But when you got into a kind of close range pell-mell battle of manoeuvre, like Trafalgar, Cape St Vincent, and so on and so forth, then the greater agility of the British ships came into its own, which was also relatively handy at avoiding things like rocks and shoals. And lastly, for the purposes of our discussion today, we're going to briefly touch on friction, resistance, and vortexes. Now, this is one of, if not the most complicated sections of hull design, so it will necessarily, again, be a relatively brief and primer-style overview. But all other factors we've mentioned aside, the actual shape of your hull underwater can make a huge difference to the final output of what you get in terms of speed, stability, etc. Now, this is perhaps most typified by the test tanks and modelling of William Froud, who came up, at least famously, for engineers who have covered hydraulics and or naval architecture with the Froud number, which is a way of describing the resistance of a vessel or an object in water. Now, if you've ever seen wind tunnel tests, usually done on car bodies or aircraft, where they put smoke or some other kind of visual indicator into the tunnel, you will see that as the fluid, the air, flows over the object, it tends to start to break up. In some areas, the fluid will adhere very closely to the form of whatever the object is, but then either as it continues along or as it breaks away from the object, you start to get disruptions, and you start to get vortexes, and you start to get lines that just spiral off into all sorts of fun places. Now, those are indicators of resistance. And resistance will give you drag, and drag will slow you down. And of course, again, your hull is in a 3D environment underwater, so it's not just a simple case of, you know, a, a nice needlepoint shape, or something similar, 
because the water that flows under your ship is just as important as the water that flows along the sides of your ship. Now, this resistance, which is due to friction, is the other major factor when it comes to determining a ship's speed. Obviously, the amount of water you're forcing out of the way in the first place is going to be the dominant factor in practically all cases, which is why you need that nice thin uh, hull shape and the nice small overall cross-sectional area facing forward. But there's only a limited amount you can do with that before you make your ship too narrow and it falls over or various other permutations to that effect. And so where the gains will come in, for the most part, in late 19th and into the early 20th century in terms of shipbuilding, come from this underwater hull shape. An example of just how much of a difference this can make can be seen in some of the early, really heavily armoured ironclads. So you have the Caio Duilio class of ironclads that the Italians built. These were capable of about 15 knots on just under 11,000 tonnes. The response ship that the Royal Navy built to the Caio Duilios was HMS Inflexible. Now, HMS Inflexible also weighed just under 11,000 tonnes, was also capable of around 15 knots, but it was shorter and wider than the Caio de Wilios. Now, in conventional terms, based on everything else we've just learned, that should mean that Inflexible should be slower for the same power plant, but perhaps a little bit more agile. Now, the thing is, Inflexible actually had a considerably weaker power plant. Inflexible had about 6,500 horsepower as compared to the Caio Duilio's just over 7,700 horsepower. So the Caio Duilio's have a slightly better hull shape in terms of their length to beam ratio and they have more power. So you would expect them to go faster given their weigh about the same as the Inflexible's. But no, they're actually about the same speed. So why, when Inflexible is shorter, stubbier, and has less powerful engines, is it making the same speed? Well, it's because it's one of the first ships, if not the first capital ship, designed using Froud's methods of refining its underwater hull form. And that is a fairly good illustration of just how much of a difference this kind of scientific underwater hull form testing can be. For added fun when it comes to hull forms, as with some of the other things we've mentioned, these things can behave differently at different speeds. So a hull form that's actually much more efficient at low speeds can be very inefficient at high speeds, but a hull form that's capable of moving at considerably high speeds with a relative degree of fuel economy and less, using less power can actually be very impractical at low speeds. And again, that's a matter for a whole other video. But whilst ideally when you're talking about the water flowing along your hull, you want the minimum possible amount of vortexes and pressure disruptions possible in order to minimize the amount of increased friction on your hull and therefore optimize your speed, you do face one issue, which is at your stern. Because at the stern, your ship runs out. Water flows back into the space and volume that was occupied by your ship, and that is going to create a lot of vortexes. Now, those vortexes, tend to be of a somewhat lower pressure than the surrounding sea and that exerts a drag force that basically is trying to haul your ship back into the void that it just left in very simple terms. Now if you detach those main lines of flow from your hull earlier then you have that issue somewhat less but at the same time you have a lot of vortexes running down the last bit of your ship's hull which increases resistance so it's not a perfect solution. One of the ways around this at least for higher speeds is the transom stern. The transom stern being where you cut basically cut the end off the stern so you just have a completely flat stern section and this at least when you're moving at higher speeds allows the water flow to come down your hull nice and smoothly or as smoothly as you're ever going to get right up to the end of your ship and then it projects off and the two lines of flow meet except they now meet several dozen feet hopefully behind you and you've effectively tricked if you like the water into thinking that the ship is longer than it actually is so the vortex formation happens but it's now happening a bit well behind your ship 
and the drag that it's exerting is being exerted on mostly the water that lies between you and the vortexes, and so you have less resistance to your overall rate of progress. Getting the transom stern right is a somewhat complex issue, and that's why you only tend to see it really cropping up in warships by around the time of the Second World War. But, as I said, it only also really works when you're talking about moving at high speeds where your ship can outpace the area of where those flow lines are meeting. When you're operating at low speeds, it's actually a slight negative because the water now has a very sharp corner to go around, and that creates a fair amount of vortexes and thus lowers your efficiency at lower speeds. So you then have to make a decision with something like a transom stern or a more traditional, more pointed or rounded stern as to what speed regimen you're going to be operating in and what other sacrifices in terms of stability, durability, etc. you are going to make in order to get that transom stern in. But since we've just about hit the hour mark, I think that's probably just enough for today going over some of the many factors that will influence your choice of hull form. If you would like to hear more information about any one or more of these factors in more detail, well, warning, it will involve an awful lot of formula and 3D diagrams, but we can go into that at some point in the near future. But hopefully you begin to understand just how complex not just choosing the armament for a ship is, but choosing the form that the hull will take and how there is no really one right answer because for any given situation, any given nation, any given operating environment and any given time period, there will be multiple answers depending on what exactly it is you want to do with a particular vessel. So thank you very much for listening and see you again later. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.